Hello, welcome to today's SEI webcast, Finding Your Way with Software Engineering Buzzwords. My name is Shane McGraw, Outreach Team Lead here at the Software Engineering Institute, and I'd like to thank you for attending. We want to make our webcast today as interactive as possible, so please put any comments or questions you have into the YouTube chat area, and we will address as many as we can today. Our featured speaker today is Hassan Yassar. Hassan is the technical director of the Continuous Deployment Capability Team here at the Software Engineering Institute. He leads an engineering group that develops prototype solutions uh, within the SEI's uh, Software Solutions Division, and he's also an adjunct professor at Carnegie Mellon University. Welcome, Hassan. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Shane. I'm excited to be part of another great discussion with you. Yeah, so I think we've got a really interesting topic. Um, talking about these buzzwords we keep seeing coming up. Um, so recently, you know, kind of the genesis of today's event, we, we keep seeing postings on LinkedIn and various sites about uh, things like DevOps being dead. Um, so, you know, coming to you, we want to know what your perspective is. Can you give us some education today on how these buzzwords fit together, um, what people should be looking at, where they should be starting with all this stuff. So maybe we just start with that first question. Is DevOps dead? And if it's not dead, or if it's not dead, give us a little uh, interaction or education on what it actually is, uh, what DevSecOps is. Can you give us a little history there and uh, give us a little more insight? Absolutely, Shane. And I'm hearing the similar questions as well most of the time, even though in my class as well, I have been teaching at the CMU or dealing a lot of SCI clients as well. Is DevOps is really that? I think that's a kind of a similar analogy we use most of the time. If we're going to create a new term, if we are going to create a new type of concept or some terminology, we always exit out the first one. Like instead of saying version one, version two, we just coming up a new term and saying version one is that instead of improving. So DevOps is, is that honest? It's not. It's not a new concept either. It's not the old either. It is, it is actually evolving. It is getting more into the business. When we try to really create some of our needs, like when I say needs about the, some roles maybe, maybe we are trying to address some other challenges. And then when we define those challenges, we are trying to come up with a new name of that challenges. And sometimes challenge is really becoming a role, becoming a things like a job role. That's kind of a, a confusion starts. And again, and where the confusion starts when we define what the role is required to achieve the job versus what the mindset looks like. So when the confusion starts and people are saying it, DevOps is dead, or or the no ops is the new things, or low code, no code is the new concept, or the kind of like a uh, the MLOps is new concept, or GitOps is another new concept, a new ideas, or a platform engineer, another new concept ignoring or omitting others. So again, it's really becoming a more role. So overall, for me, my opinion, DevOps is not that, it is evolving. It is getting more broad range and addressing many other areas as well. The concept is important. We're gonna, I guess we're gonna discuss a lot what the concept means, what the software engineering principles are. So we can really think about the overall engineering thinking, overall engineering principles, what really forcing us to define those terminologies. Another thing, Shane, if I may, I would like to really share a couple uh, quick search, what I did recently. And I really looked at uh, almost all this uh, definition of the terms, like what SRA means. Again, we're gonna cover up most of them today. It will take hours maybe to cover, but as much as we can, you know, when you look at uh, what does MLOps means or what is SRE platform, GitOps, I kind of got the definition of those uh, term and, and put into the word cloud and then to do some waiting on the word. That's what it really came up. It really came up as the DevOps is still, still is the high in terms of the word. And also another things that came out as a platform, a team, teams and operations and learning pieces. There is kind of product. So these are kind of keep coming up most of the time of this definitions and what the purpose are. I think we have to discuss about the, what the purpose of this vocabulary is. When we look at this, just this word uh, cloud, 
And it's really telling me we are trying to address operational needs seems to be for us. So we're going to cover up more operational needs means what DevOps means. That's great. And so on, yeah, like um, from my perspective, just seeing different things, if anything, DevOps is finally great gaining traction within the DOD community. Is that something you have seen as, as your, as, in your role as well? Yes, I see a lot. And it is, it is not just the Department of Defense, actually. Industry still try to use DevOps concept in everywhere. And then maybe can a little bit scroll down for to what the DevOps, what the DevSecOps means. We can really discuss in detail as well. It is growing and with respect to the needs. So first of all, like again, let's define the we can have the purpose. Is really DevOps is kind of a principles and practice. It's really key elements right here. There are principles, there are practices. And 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 getting all the stakeholders, like it's really important, another subject we have to be aware of it, getting all the stakeholders in the software systems in the life cycle. So stakeholders are really contributing into the product development. Product development, again, can be an application, maybe a software application, can be some hardware component that may be a software in it. So people are using this communication and a collaboration using a new set of principles. So DevOps is not really changing software engineering practices at all. When I say the software engineering practices, I'm just going to a little bit scroll down here and then talking about overall life cycle. When you look at the software engineering way that we do, still we are, we have to understand what the requirements looks like. Still, we have to understand what is our architectural design. We have to design the, anything we can do, even though, even though by writing a basic hello world, still we have to think about what is my requirements, what is my design. Then we can write a develop and test and delivery. So DevOps or DevSecOps or any of this term is not really changing how we do the software engineering. What it does really, it is improving our communications, improving our collaborative environment, improving our ability to respond to any incidents, in improving our quality to meet the business needs. This is really important to meet our business needs. Why people are asking the DevOps or with the security integration with the DevSecOps, again, which is another security, we're gonna, I guess we're going to talk a lot on security as well, is when we ignore the the user's business needs, if he cannot meet the business needs as a user needs, we cannot deliver the right product. We cannot deliver the right capabilities to our end users. That's the reason every organization, they are trying to improve either their processes and practice and using the, the way of thinking about automations and being responsive, being communicative, being collaborative, these are the way people are using to improve their state of practicing in engineering perspective. What they do with the DevOps mindset, again, let's go scroll up one more time, including a great communication and collaboration with all stakeholders. And I have to a little bit further down here, Shane, why this came as important as a software community and when the waterfall, waterfall paper came out in early 1970s, 71, 72, Dr. Winston Royce, he brought that waterfall concept. In his original paper, he criticized siloed thinking, siloed way of requirements, architecture, analysis, design. As a community, we kind of structure our organizations based on what we believe based on what we heard, instead of really thinking engineering, and he criticized and said, don't do the siloed work, because if you do, you will fail. But as a community, we took a very literature perspective. We took that concept. Then we start the silo, and we failed. So DevOps is saying, let's go back to the what we are thinking in engineering. Let's communicate and collaborate, because we fail if you do the waterfall thinking. Now, how can we do all this? communication and collaborations, it is requiring other elements, which is uh, team structures, 
which is automations, monitoring. These are the uh, practices important and getting it secured on top of it. So that's the reason people really, really likes to have and use the DevOps because they see a value of it. So it is it that it is not because it's it's really meeting the user needs. What we really think about that, it is not changing how you do the software engine principles. The challenge comes in a picture like how can we implement and uh, those principles? That's the tough part. It is not that easy. That's what the people as a community we fail for implementation. Now we are coming up a new term as platform engineering, or we are creating a new team for addressing operational needs, which is SRA, or we are looking for no ops as an example, looking for operation perspective and then and getting only the, let the developer team do that. So that's kind of like, the, for me, that's kind of why it started to come up a, a new type of a definition of the new term and because implementation is getting sometimes difficult. So how do organizations align themselves with these new terms and so on? What would your be advice to, to, for them? Yeah, and I'm going to a little bit further down on, let's let's discuss about uh, what are the difficulties people are seeing it and what is really deriving this terminology. Maybe I can open up a little bit more here and then we'll come back to the organization alignments. So typically we said, let's communicate and collaborate, right? So again, I'm going to go back to the, our principles so we have uh, four main principles of DevOps. We would like to have more uh, collaborations, more communications. We can have infrastructure code, automations, and monitoring. So it seems simple. If we ha if I have a good platform, I can communicate. I can collaborate with everybody else. Or if I write the code as my uh, backend components, backend dependencies, backend infrastructure, I can. But sometimes having a just having a platform only let's say i'm going to build up my uh, my tools i'm writing an applications in my application i would like to deploy into the my uh, production environment and i'm going to deploy into the my uh, prod environment production which is my kind of operation environment that i would like to use so now what i'm really trying to get it here which is my operational if i put that this is my dev site this is my kind of an upside to get into the application to the production, there are a lot of things that needs to be done early in the life cycle. Early in the software life cycle needs to be done. Like if I am writing a, a kind of production that like I'm writing a component as an application that has to be scalable to many users, like maybe millions of users I would like to scale up, I have to do some preliminary work. If I am looking for covering up multiple cloud and wide, maybe multiple data centers that I would like to use it, multiple DCs, I may have to do some preparations. What the preparation is really requiring, I have to do the right requirements right here. In my requirements, I have to get it. I have to understand what is my architectural design so I can really fit my user needs as an example. This is more about the uh, organizational vision organization business needs then i would like to deliver it to get my needs but how i am delivering the capabilities this is our platform that we would like to use so which is kind of our software delivered environments let's go back a little bit here i'm just going to come back to the uh, platform engineering a little bit in this context like we are really building up our organizational team right here this is kind of our application teams so that's their job to build up the software. But remember, the application team is not just the dev team. It is combined many other stakeholders. If you narrow down only the dev on the software engineer, we are missing the point again, because we can deliver, we can write the software quickly, faster and faster and faster. But end of the day, if we are delivering a, a not quality or maybe crappy code, and our users, we're not going to accept it, and we have a a bad business KPIs here, we will lose the ability. We can lose our customers. So how can we really get back into the team? So we have to really think about what are the application development teams is required to know. So it's not just the dev right now. Now we are expanding the scope with other stakeholders. So that's kind of a connection. Why is important? How organization will align? They have to align 
for their business. What I'm going to do? What is the purpose I'm trying to achieve? What is my business objective that I would like to achieve? What is my service level objective that I would like to achieve? Based on this type of metrics, then we can feed back to the team, which is my application team. Again, application team is not just the developer. It is beyond the developers. It is business managers, security teams, and users should be part of it somehow, and risk team, compliance team. There are many teams needs to be involved based on what is our business objectives. So we're going to dive into the more uh, probably down the road again, Shane. Yeah, that's great. So I just want to chime in with the audience too. Like, feel free to, to put into the, the, the chat here questions you have for Zon, your experience with some of these terms, new terms you may be hearing. Uh, we'd love to make this as interactive as possible. So feel free to type those questions in and we'll take as many as we can here uh, in, in the real time. So that, that is, thank you, Shane. Thanks for reminding that. I really like that the more discussion so we sure. can get more into the needs because all, if you're going to try to explain all these new terminologies in the screen we see, it takes a lot of time. But we have to really scroll, we have to really think about in the low level, what is our purpose? What is our mission? What is the objective we would like to deliver? You know, we are delivering any capabilities. Again, capability should have a mission. Capability should have a direct impact to the users. If I am building an application, if it is not used by the end users, what is the value? which is every capable should have a value. So now the value, maybe we can say, yeah, the value is not always a dollar associated, but there is an impact. Some software is bringing some dollar to the organizations as, as, the, as the revenue. Some services is for human life, some of impact for the community, some of for the mission specific. In DOD perspective, we are trying to save the warfighter and we are trying to get into the mission and, and save the life and then save the company. This is really important as a mission specific. It's not always the, the revenue, it's about the impact. That's kind of a deriving our business. So based on impact, maybe you can scroll down here a little bit and discuss about a little bit more in detail. Based on what we are delivering that has an impact. So now we can build up the right infrastructures we can build up the right team we can build up the what is required to build up this capabilities right here so going back to the original discussion what we had we said a waterfall thinking right the waterfall thinking we should have more siloed have the requirements done and then go to the architecture done go to design each steps it's not working anymore which we learn that lesson so now, based on the user, based on the value, we can go back and, and build up a small cadence and make sure that we are delivering the right product to the users and users will use it and get a feedback. That's kind of another uh, important to understand with the DevOps mindset. And we really have a more communication and a collaboration with all stakeholders. When we say the communication and collaboration, it's not just the talking on the one time. We are talking about the feedback mechanisms between other stakeholders. Feedback is not just a, a one team member. Sometimes we confuse. We are thinking about the feedback only getting from users. But in reality, there are many feedbacks we are receiving. We are receiving feedbacks from end product from user perspective, but we are receiving a feedback from our testers. We are receiving feedback from our designers feedback from developer. There are many feedbacks in the software lifecycle. It is not the one-time things. And sometimes feedback is generated from the tools. Maybe static analysis will, tool will tell us the feedback as based on the security findings. Maybe have the feedbacks based on the test results we do using some functional testings maybe. Maybe feedback and based on the performance testing within our infrastructure pieces. Maybe feedback is gonna be specific to our business. Sometimes we often ignore the feedback may be specific to the compliances and other important things like what organizations is driving based on the compliances. Like healthcare industry is different than the financial sectors and Department of Defense is different than the web companies based on their business, based on their mission. So it's, it's basic communication is about the feedback mechanisms. So how about a quick question, Hassan? We got one from John. Um, 
to asking about for DevSecOps. Is security and development or security and operation more important? It's a great question. And that goes back to the, my DevSecOps definition right here. It is integrating security throughout the life cycle. It is not the death. It is not just an ops. It is requiring the both dev and ops people together. Let's open up a little bit more into the engineering principles again, so we can discuss a little bit further down. If I am delivering a capability here, which is my end product, right? What type of security requirements or the or operation requirements, typically ops people, they already know their security postures. That security posture maybe depend on some operating systems, maybe depends on their uh, components. So if I know my attack vectors here as the SEC person, security person, maybe they have a SEC op teams, secret operations team, they already know their organizational security requirements, security postures. So that information has to be planned at the requirement phases. And it has to be implemented in architecture as the design phases. And it has to be addressed in development phases and also the testing phases. If we get only the development phase here for a security, it is too late because sometimes we are really deriving our development activities based on the some security testing result, like what the static analysis says. But the question we always struggle what is enough is enough for the security testing? How much we can prioritize our security findings? What is the impact for us? What is the value for us? When I say the value and impact goes back to our business mission, right? There is a delivery perspective. And another problem, again, going back to the DevSecOps pieces, if I don't know as the dev, as the team member right here, let's say I'm a sec person, so I'm some kind of responsible for testing and delivering and deployments as a security person, if I don't plan security in my requirements, in my, as a developer, in my uh, kind of my sprint plannings or my scrum or my cases, and I cannot add those findings to address it in my daily workload. I'm going to share the one statistic here, Shane. And based on the DevSecOps survey we have done almost last six, seven years, 90% of developers, they strongly believe security is important, but they are saying they don't have enough time to address security. Why? Because we never think about security as early in the life cycle as in the planning. So in that regards, security should be across the life cycle, starting from end to end, from always from feature request and to delivery. And other things we should really think about that security is evolving. It is not the uh, moment that we can say we are secure today. It is, it is getting changing every time. Like we, I may have some dependencies. Some of the dependencies may not be vulnerable today, but it might be vulnerable for tomorrow. Who knows? We learned that lesson a lot. I mean, like if you remember the, the community like Open Shell or the Shell Shop or a couple other vulnerabilities, the community was, the community has, they have been using for those dependencies for years. 10 years later, we discovered the vulnerabilities. And there was another one that happened Log4j in 2021, November. We used a lot. So we cannot really guarantee that we have a secure systems all the time. It's about there being a resilient. How can we be resilient to the, our operations, to the, our and users, our goal is, again, we are keep saying over and over and again, we would like to make sure we have a value we deliver to the users and business as an impact. That's what we are talking about. Now, to address those readiness, we have to have a plan. We have to have a really mindset implementations in our engineering and software engineering life cycles. So is, is it a time and money thing, Hassan, that security is not typically addressed through the life, life cycle? Is addressing it through the life cycle? Is it adding a bunch of money, or just holding holding the product from being out in the market? Good, good, good question, Shane. And what I have been seeing so far as the community, we are not able to quantify the value of the security. But in reality, there is an organizational team members. They know what the value means for the business features. 
if we cannot connect the security requirements as the value of the feature we are delivering, if we cannot connect, we cannot quantify, we cannot plan it. So more specific implementation, maybe we can talk about that. Let's say I'm building up a one basic web applications that I'm writing on it, basic one login pages as an example. If that login page is compromised, what is the impact to the organizations? If I am in a in a specific compliant organizations, I may have more requirements to be compliant than maybe data is going to get stolen, maybe data got breached or something may happen, maybe I'm going to lose my uh, patient's data. There's a lot of complications. So risk team, usually they have a value they define. If I lost this type of features or capabilities in my business, there's an impact. So impact is really telling me and uh, the impact is the cost of the losing that services. So that cost can be based on some vulnerabilities, based on some security. Some of them may be the failure. So I'm going to jump to the little bit on the SRE concept. So since we are talking about all the buzzwords, like literally SRE team members, they are trying to make sure that their infrastructures is operational. It is up and running all the time. Because it's always difficult to keep operation up and running, including the security component. Again, security is part of it. We cannot ignore it. But sometimes if we don't plan up front, we are missing the components. And other things is really we should aware of that, going back to the value, the complexity of the system that we are building, it's really tremendous right now. Like if I remember myself about 25, 30 years ago, we were able to write a program from scratch. We know every piece of components. Now we all dependent many other services. Like we have a complexity problem, we have a connectivity problem, we have an extensibility problem. As SRE team members, they are focusing more about the operational side. They are looking for how can I make sure that I can address any operational reliabilities as it's called software reliable engineering, site reliable engineering. So basically site reliable engineering is about my operational environment. I'm going to make sure that I have built up the more reliabilities on my operation environment. To build up the reliabilities, I have to write maybe automation scripts on my components. Maybe I have to automate some of the findings. I can do the, some capacity planning. I can do some production thinking and I can build up the my capabilities. So yes, if I learn something from this type of environments, I'm going to feed back to the dev team. I'm going to feed back to the operational team, let them continue what they are doing. So it's basically creating a, a new type of role, new type of teams. That team is are focused on specifically improving oper operational quality. In other words, I can say kind of like a DevOps and SRE, I got a lot of questions like DevOps versus SRE. SRE is complementing DevOps. It is more operational, more in implementation on the operational side. It's about the more team structures, but DevOps mindset is exist. It will continue. It is end to end. It is including operational, but to define a specific certain responsibilities, and we need to define some team members are focused on specifically for operation environment. Which they have, they, their job is also think about the security. So I know with stuff from the value, but that's their job is also make sure that we're addressing security. It's not just the, you know, product reliable. It's not availability. It's also security as a part of the chain. So we had a good question from, or a comment from Larry as long as we could address to get back to the DevOps and the coding and him mentioning how many, many developers don't know how to code securely. So what's your, what's your advice there? What, what, tools or services out there to, to bring secure development into play. Great. So let's go back to the, our definition again. That's it's, it's a great one. To improve the, the security practicing, improving our quality. And in reality, security is basically one of the quality attributes, right? That's one of the components. How are we writing the code in terms of the good quality, code styling, and some code complexities? or architecturally, or looking for some shortcut, maybe some improving the you know, code with removing the dead codes. It is about the quality. 
So when we talk about the quality, there are availabilities, modifiabilities, modularities, there are many abilities. Secret is one of them. Yes, the FP team member, they don't know a lot of those practice. So what we should do, we have to communicate. We have to collaborate. We have to share. We, what the sharing means, and going back to the communicating each other, like if I am a security person in my organizations, I have to share my attack vectors. I have to share my security postures. I have to share my infrastructures requirement to the dev team. And then there are many tools is available on with respect to, let's say, if I am doing some sort of a testing in my here as a test environment, maybe I'm using some static analysis here, and or maybe I'm using some test, static application security testing or dynamic application security testings. All these type of tools that are many tools available. The key point is here, we have to get the feedback. As we said, the feedback is not just the communicating as human to human. We are looking for the feedback from tools, feeding back to the dev team, as well as feeding back to the other team members as well. So how can we educate the team members to write the secure coding? It's a journey. It is not happening right away. And I see in my CME class as well, I have been teaching software security courses for and almost like six, seven years, I see the similar patterns and we don't really do a good job on undergrad and teaching security a lot. We always look at for good quality of writing uh, good softwares. When I say good software, good performance, good availabilities, good reliabilities. But security is evolving. It's keep changing, keep adding in new vulnerabilities or new code practicing. So these are the things it's more specific to the language, specific to domain. If I am an engineer, if I'm going to write a C code, if I'm going to write a Python code, I have to look at what are the security practices are for Python code that I'm going to use. I can implement those in my coding. Now, going back to the another thing we shared a couple of minutes ago, developers probably they know or they would like to learn, but if it is not planned in their daily life cycle, in their scrum, in their sprint, it's very hard for them to dedicate their own time to learn because something has to drive. So what is really driving the, for developers? They are trying to write the, the capabilities or they are trying to write any features based on what has been planned. So we can add those planning and then we can build up the tools. Tool is basically educating the team members and then they can write the code. So tool can help and team members can help. And then as working as a team together, we can build up the a good as secure the team structures. They can share information with each other and we can build up the security postures as well. So that was going to be the, the next comment or a comment from, I think it was Ron in the, the chat, Hassan, asking about languages is one more secure th than the other and some resources now i know cert has a ton of work in secure yes. code in various languages but you kind of touch on that though it, it's not the language itself they all have uh you know what, what guidance do you say to, to that is, is one language more secure than the other and again I, it, yes young one is secure than others and because more modern languages are handling a lot of low level vulnerabilities behind the scene that does like python is an example versus c c plus plus i'll tell depends on the the value depends on the technologies that depends on the product that they are building it really requiring the communicate and with the right team members we can really get all together so maybe I think I should have somewhere here about the team structure right here. It's really the choice we have. We have to ask ourselves, maybe I should look at from tools perspective right here. Really, we have to look at it's my, my one of my favorite pictures, by the way. So about the periodic uh, DevOps tools. So the language we can choose based on our technology needs. If I am writing a, a tools, if I'm writing a program, it's requiring more closer to the uh, CPU or memory, I have to use that language. If I am looking for something very quick and easy in the web, we have to use those, pick that language. You can write everything as a web platform using a C code, but depends, it's end of the day, what is the 
for our authorization we would like to do. And almost every language, if you follow the secure coding practices, which serve as a lot of content, we can share end of the, our presentations. And they can see what are the code practices are. If we follow those secure coding practices, and almost every language is secure, but it depends on us how much we are applying those secret practices in our code. If I'm using a Python code as an example, if I ignore the, some of the common parameters on the Python, it will be unsecure. If I'm writing a, a basic HTML page, maybe writing some AngularJS, maybe other web platform, if I'm not following the cross scriptings or some session hijacking the type, type, this type of vulnerabilities, still the same problem happens. So we really follow the code practice based on the language we choose. How are we going to choose that? And we have to ask ourselves, what is the purpose I'm trying to do? What is the thing I'm trying to achieve? Engineering is the same. We are using different way of interpret our write-ups based on the serve our missions. Now we can ask, what is the time that I would like? Which one is faster? Which one is going to give me a high quality? Which one I can reuse it? Which one I can take an advantage of it? Let's build up organizational structures and build up that capabilities. When, another question from John Hassan asking, you know, Dev, DevOps or DevSecOps in highly regulated environments, is it something that's more important for them or is it more difficult to implement? So it is. It is important, so I'm going to a little bit dive into the, our fundamental team types. So I'm going to go back to the team structure a little bit more. The highly regulated environments means we have some compliances that we have to follow. Probably we should really look at here, and then we can go to the regulation pieces as well. So I have to really follow up my legal. I have to look at my data privacy. This is my maybe the compliance. So, so if I am in an organization, organization is requiring to follow some certain compliances, and I cannot have the same way of building a software delivery deployment as web companies are just writing a product, as an example. So business is the driving for our needs and for the compliance perspective. And Department of Defense has regulations based on the AET as an example. And healthcare has the HIPAA and HIPAA and Healthcare Privacy Act information. There is a SOAX for the financial sector. There's a GDPR for the data regulations, global data regulations and from European base, but there is also the US version of California. There are many compliances is dry for the organization. So that type of organization, they have to follow what the legal, what the compliances are saying it. Now we can use the uh, DevOps principles in those mindset. DevOps is not kind of, or the creating a pipeline. It is not against those. It is not a blocker. It's more about enabler. And most of the financial sectors are taking advantage of DevOps mindset for addressing the compliance needs. And other things also I can highlight, it's about the auditing. So if I am following the compliances and there is auditing elements of compliance, somebody, third party or an organizational entity will audit their requirements and how we are doing well. Do we follow the age trust for the, the healthcare? Do we follow the right uh, compliances for the financial sector? Do we have a segregation of duties? This type of audit requirements can be generated automatically from the pipeline perspective. How can we generate those data? Going back to the engineering principles again, we can use the same collaborative communication, same environment like a repositories. We can put every uh, code into the repos and we can track those into the, our planning, which is what DevOps says. And then we can really trace all the requirements from all the way to the beginning to the deployment, keeping the right versioning, keeping infrastructure creations, keeping the provisioning components with the traceabilities. Auditors love DevOps a lot. I saw so many stories. Auditors are able to generate those results from the pipeline directly. When I say the pipeline, and which goes back to the game DevOps definitions right here, we're looking for more about the, you know, uh, creating the uh, the 
the using the some principles and practices, if I'm using some continuous integration practices or continuous delivery practices, will help me to generate those data sets. That data sets will be fed back to auditors and auditors will follow the compliance requirements. So DevOps and DevSecOps definitely is a big gain for a highly regulated environment as well. And I have to a little bit open up here as well, a little bit different. There are uh, team concepts, like goes back to the SRE and goes back to the, another one from Amazon concept, like you build it, you run it concept. There is another one came from the, the, the Metaverse Facebook about the production engineering. This type of concept, it is more operational, more about thinking, right? Let's say in Amazon concept, you build it, you run it. What that really means, I'm a developer, I'm writing the code, and most I'm responsible for maintaining the code as well. Maintaining the code, it's going to be production environment. This concept may not work for the highly regulated environment because there is a segregation of duties. What it really means as a developers, I cannot touch the production environments. Somebody has to look at the real uh, live data as a developers, I cannot because I have to be segregated. In the DevOps mindset, we are talking about the community. DevOps doesn't say developer will do everybody's job. Developer can do the operational job. DevOps doesn't say no ops. DevOps says, let's communicate. Let's collaborate. Let's share the same vision and mindset. Let's become an agile. Let's think about our organization to respond to business needs. What is really required to do that? If we have to change our mindset of what is my job as a DevOps way to achieve others? So I know a little bit of length answer I gave it. It's more about and applying those principles with organizational derivatives, with organizational leads, which is business needs that we are talking about so far. Thanks for that, Hassan. One, one more from Dean while we're you know still talking about DevOps and teams here. Does a good DevOps team look more like the old functional team or the application-based team? So that's a great question. Actually, goes back to the one of the things I had prepped before about the roles and responsibilities. Let me go here, and we can discuss in a little bit more about the roles and responsibilities. So in a in a DevOps structures, and then it's going kind of responding to our new terminology as well. We have been discussing so far. Really, but we have to ask ourselves: What is the roles that I would like to achieve? What is what is the roles? What I'm trying to achieve that roles. And then how can I structure those roles? Again, you may have some uh, defined roles in the life cycle. You may have a product engineer, you may have a service designer, you may have a tech writer, you may have software engineers. So you have a different roles. These are more about the skills. What the skill is really telling us, I have a data analysis skill here. I have some other engineering skills for a cloud architect. So we have more about the skills is requiring to get the job done. And then how I'm going to share my inputs and outputs is really talking what the cloud architect is asking from me as a developers, then I can answer their needs. So we have a skill, so we can build up the skill, which is engineering skills. And how are we teaming up together? And we can create a more about a kind of a team structure. Team structure will be more communicative, more sharing, more talking to each other. So there are a couple of examples, and I would like to share with everyone about the team structures. So based on this is a basically a team topology. I like the Manuel Paz, and he's the one of the creator of the team topology book. He recommended there are uh, four type of teams. Again, this is kind of a different way of thinking. Like forget a moment about the applications or creating more about the designers and testers and quality, but there are teams are focusing on more uh, responsibilities for end-to-end -end flow, which is that's their job, which is kind of a developer they're writing the code. Maybe they're managing. They kind of build up the end-to-end, -end, which is more about day-to-day -day job. Some team members are enabling, which is they're supporting some technical product domain based on the, what certain requirement looks like. Maybe they are doing some compliance as an example. Maybe they are looking for some certain uh, the functionalities that stream align team, they you know they have it. If he is looking for very specific niche areas that comes into the complicated systems, like let's say Kubernetes, everybody's talking about the Kubernetes in this DNH. 
I'm not expecting everybody to be an expert in Kubernetes. That's a wrong assumption. It doesn't mean in a DevOps concept, everybody knows everything. It's a wrong. If I'm an expert and Kubernetes team members, they can expert in writing a very complicated deployment files. They may do the best practicing for ingress and in, in ingress protocols. Maybe there's some configurations they can do. By the way, I have to tell that 95% uh, of the Kubernetes cluster are not secure because we never really think about for complicated systems. We never really dedicated uh, roles and responsibilities. So we can define what the roles and responsibilities can be defined and that can be complicated as systems who are responsible, maybe writing a specific code for vision or maybe writing a specific code for the high uh, uh, speed transactions. Maybe they're building some very complex deployment scenarios. There's a platform teams, platform teams are more uh, structured. Again, this is our team, these are the role. These are not the concept, these are the roles. The platform team members, they can focus on supporting a delivery and stream aligned system to support an NOI. So these are the typical structures. How can we get these teams together based on our value, based on our mission and vision we would like to do? We can combine those. So when the teams are talking, I like another one that came from Manuel Paris, and he talk about the communication, collaboration, and the facilitation. So these are the how teams are interacting each other. Sometimes we can communicate, we can really collaborate on the same topics. Let's work together, which goes back to the uh, DevOps mindset. Let's let's communicate. Maybe sometimes we just can use the same platform. Let's use the same platform, right? And then another one is X as a service that specific team member, they may be just supplying some services for other team members, maybe just writing uh, some of the backup components, which is SRE team is a perfect example, right? And then another team member are facilitating. Goes back to the uh, original things. We, it is not a, a simple application or system that we are building. It's very complicated, very complex. We need to communicate many other team members. And the facilitation, it's helping to communicate each other. So if you get all together, and maybe you can think about it is the one way of creating a, an example of team topologies, we can really build up a a team are focusing on delivering an applications. If there is a specific needs, let's get a complicated system. Teams are supporting for their specific needs. Instead of me as a developers, I'm gonna stop everything, try to learn, be an expert in Kubernetes. Yes, I need to know about it, but I'm not gonna be expert. Let the people help me out to create the right structures in the platform perspective. So they can communicate each other. If there is any specific service need in between, and they can communicate based on the specific needs. Now, technically we are asking, I need a help. Can somebody help me out? I need that skill set. So now as the community, when the skill set is required and we are saying, okay, DevOps is dead. Let's, let's go back to the SRE concept, let's go back to the ML ops, let's go back to the you know no ops and then a product for engineering. We're always missing the key elements here. It's really we have to structure our team to help each other. Okay. And then going back to the final things, we can build up a platform teams are responsible for building up the delivery infrastructure. It is not replacing how things are we are building. That's their job. They can build up a great uh, platform. That platform will be available for uh, developers and architects, all stakeholders, they can do their function well. It doesn't mean that every developer, they have to create their own dev environment. It is not. And developers are responsible to use the same environments. So they can communicate each other. They can collabor collaborate each other. They can share the information each other versus creating different silos. That's what the confusion starts, honestly. That's kind of how we are really losing the point because we kind of confuse what the role means, what the mindset looks like. Mindset is the DevOps as an example, mindset. The platform engineering for me, again, it's the roles that we do. It's a team. So team structures are responsible of supporting operational environment. That might be using some other uh, techniques. Maybe they are using some new concepts on 
improving the resilience in their production environments. That's kind of a oriented. So I'm kind of probably getting towards the end. I would like to say a couple of words about the overall three things really aligned together. I always, there is kind of a balance. There is a people element, there is a process element, there is a platform. It has to, I know it's a classical term, but it is true all the time. End of the day, we need a people. People as we are, we are the community members. We need to communicate, we need to collaborate, we have to share, we have to, to agree with each other. Based on what? Based on our business value, based on the impact that we would like to do. When we really get together and talking, we should have some sort of an agreement, which is a process pieces, which goes back to the uh, DevOps definition. Again, there are common process and practice, a set of practices, set of process. If I am setting up a continuous integration as an example, I need to have a common understanding about, I'm gonna follow up those integration process I can integrate multiple code pieces, multiple team members. I can do the testing. If I don't commit my code every day or every end of the sprint, there is no benefits of continuous integration. We just basically cheating ourselves. We are saying we did the CI, but we never do the CI because we never follow the common process. We don't have a common understanding between the team members. Okay. Like, I know we were, we were discussing before, Shane, about S1, another example, software bill of materials. There is a process pieces, there's a tooling elements. If I don't follow as a developer the guidance on grabbing the code from Stack Overflow, it's a process piece, it's a governance. I can use dependency management on my environment to keep track of all my libraries. I may use different formatting, different tools. End of the day, I'm a developer, I have to follow some guidance. I'm a people, I'm a developers. I'm gonna follow the guidance. What the guidance is really telling me is those process. Then lastly, about the platform pieces, where the people and process meet to build up the software. That has to be automated, has to be available. Who are building those platform is a different in roles, but we are using those platforms as moving forward, as building up a capability. That can be delivered environment, can be shared infrastructures, and can be specific designed for the specific purpose of the product that we are building. So end of the day, we can deliver high quality of the capabilities for our end users. That's great stuff, Hassan. Um, as you mentioned, we're, you know, we're within about eight minutes of having to wrap up. Can we work in some advice for the, the software engineers themselves, what their particular they're they're the part they play in all this like how, how do they keep up to date with so many languages so many tools um what what advice do you got for a software engineer and get getting started and how they select their tools for their work it's a another great question thanks shane and i was going to cover up too and when we look at the that type of complexity we always ask ourselves what i'm trying to achieve as an engineer in architecting the systems or writing the code is the same. How are we writing the code depends on the language, but we should ask ourselves, what I'm going to achieve? What is my purpose? What is my why? Why I'm going to achieve that? Everybody should ask the question for themselves. Then look for the, what type of tools to help me to solve my problem. Let's say if I'm looking for some provisioning a problem. Let's say I would like to automate some of my provisioning concept. What the provisioning means, I'm going to stand up the couple of VMs and I'm going to stand up infrastructures, make sure that I'm able to act quickly to provision the backend components. This is my why. Then I have to look at the, what are the tools I may be using it that help me out. So when we look at the tools and going back to the tool complexity here that we had a minute ago, in this complexity, it's really hard to learn everything. So we can really look at what type of tools is really serving my need, and I can shape the tools for my purpose. Like I usually give an analogy is, if I'm building a, some home project, let's say I'm working some over the weekend home project, I look at the project and then I, and I go choose the tools to serve my project needs. Then I pick the right tools to, for my own purpose. 
Like in the provisioning concept, you might be using a Docker. If you're using a container application, that works well. You might be using a, a different type of application, maybe not containerized, then using a Docker will be overkilling probably. Look, you have to look at other provisioning tools, maybe Terraform, maybe other scripting you have to use. So if I'm looking for some other cloud deployments, if I'm going to use the cloud and I'm looking for something to deploy into the AWS, maybe I'm going to use the cloud formation template. Again, this is all about the why, what I'm going to use. Another thing I can suggest, and look at the some categorization, look at what are the build tools available, look at what are the testing available at this. If people are struggling, ask. Say, I need a help. Nothing is wrong to ask the, our team members, which is the team culture. It's about working each other. Our purpose to serve our business objective, business needs. Ask, share, and communicate. And work as a team to decide that. And other things, and I can advise, and if anybody's really starting to the organization as any of engineers, make sure that organizations has some a culture, that culture makes them to really work and working as a team together and let them really be find out and learn what is my requirements as an organization that I can really uh, build up and I can learn that. I may be learning some tools that the organization already using it. Don't afraid that. Use learning mechanisms and for the needs. You don't learn everything. There's no time. It's impossible. We cannot know everything. But as a team, we can be an expert for everything. So focus yourself, improve your engineering skills. When I say engineering skills, think about how much I can learn quicker. Think about what I need to know for my business needs and be able to be learn and be, be agile, be, be agile to learn the new stuff. And then they can get better and better when you spend more time to learn. With that said, I'm gonna say one more statistic here, Shane. Yep. Uh, if organizations are applying the DevOps principles, they have an ability to give more time for their developers, they can spend more time on learning. And I believe the recent survey said more than 75% of uh, team members are willing to spend their own time to learn the new concept versus non-DevOps organizations. Why? Because environment is, is encouraging to them to learn. But engineering is the same. We are not changing engineering. We're just learning another tool to, for our own needs. And last word, I would like to say, really, let's try to bend the tools to serve our needs. Don't be a tool to mandating you as a developer and restrict you. It's a wrong perspective. Let's try to bend the tool to serve our needs, our needs, our business needs, our mission. It's important. Otherwise, it's going to become a tool junk organizations. We don't want to do that. Let's build up a good engineering thinking. Let's use the science behind it and pick the tools to serve our needs. So, so on two quick ones from Larry, just um, one he asked about what tool you're using to display your notes today. So he, can you let us know that? It's a Microsoft whiteboard, and I like the like interactions. I'm trying to get away from a slide as much as I can. I hope it was interactive to everyone. And if it is confusing, apologizing. I'm using Microsoft whiteboard. And lastly, he asked. Um, you mentioned. I think the acronym was SRE, but he he's, he had mentioned SRA. So SRE is Site Reliability Engineering. Is that, that is accurate? Correct. Yes, that is correct. Site Reliability Engineering, Shane. Okay. So Larry, that that addresses those two. So. Uh, Hassan, we got about a minute left. Any, you know, any final thoughts? Uh, I see you were displaying, you know, where people can get some more information. We do lots of webcasts with you, lots of blogs, podcasts. So uh, new uh, information always there. Absolutely. I really, really encourage the engineering community. Let's work. Let's work together as a team. And there is a concept of the world of developers. We are all developing. If you look at the overall population in the world, 8 billion people are living. And how many developers we have? About 20 million, 25 million developers we have. We need to help each other. Let's try to learn. Instead of reinvent, let's try to learn. Let's try to help each other. And then a lot of information as an SCI we do, and blog posts, and as you said, webcast and podcast, anything, please reach out to us. And if any information at info.sci.cm.edu, and happy to discuss and give more information. Thanks for the opportunity, Shane.
was very Hassan, enjoyable. Yeah, Hassan, thank you very much for sharing your expertise. It was a really, uh, really educational today. Hear, hear your explanation that. So I'm sure there's lots of value found in that. So thanks for your time. Thank you, Shane. Lastly, that's uh, going to close our webcast today. We thank everyone for attending. Upon exiting, we ask that you hit that like button and share the archive if you found value. You can also subscribe to the SCI YouTube channel by clicking on the SCI seal in the lower right corner of the video window. As Hassan mentioned, any questions from today, please send to info at sei.cmu.edu. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.